In this video, we're gonna talk about polar bonds. So a polar bond is a special type of bond, so let's remind ourselves, what is a regular bond? Well, a bond between two atoms is simply when they share electrons. And a polar bond, we said, is a special type of bond, and it is specifically where there is unequal sharing of electrons. So why would this happen? Well, it's because atoms have different levels of electronegativity. So an atom's electronegativity, sometimes abbreviated EN, is a measure of how much of a quote-unquote electron hog it is. So in other words, if an atom has a high level of electronegativity, it is an electron hog. And there are actually ways to quantitatively describe how polar a bond is. So polar bonds are characterized by dipole moments. So I wrote out an example of a dipole moment over here. So take, for example, the compound sodium fluoride. So it turns out fluoride is the most electronegative element of them all. And it is so much more electronegative than sodium that it's going to hog all of the electrons over here. And we know electrons are negatively charged, right? So this is gonna result in fluorine having a partial negative charge on this atom. So that's what this sigma negative represents. And since all of the electrons are being stolen away from the sodium, sodium is gonna be left with a partial positive charge. So that means we will have a net dipole moment this way, in this direction, towards the fluorine. And the equation for dipole moment is represented right here. So mu is the Greek letter that we use to describe dipole moment, and it is equal to Q, the charge, times R, the distance that is displaced. So this charge is being displaced this way. And there are actually grades of electronegativity difference that correspond to different types of bonds. So I wanna go over this briefly. So on the scale of electronegativity difference, think about what an electronegativity difference actually is. Well, if we have two atoms here, they're each gonna have their own electronegativity levels, or EN. If we simply subtract their electronegativity levels, we get their electronegativity difference. So when there is a relatively small electronegativity difference, uh, when the difference is between zero and 0.5, we call this a nonpolar covalent bond. And an example would be chlorine bonded to chlorine, or Cl2. They both have an electronegativity level of three, so three minus three is zero. So this is a nonpolar bond. There's no, no polarity there. There's no unequal sharing of electrons. Chlorine is just as much of an electron hog as this chlorine, so they're gonna share equally. So the next level up in electronegativity difference is a polar covalent bond, and this is when the electronegativity ranges from 0.5 to two. So an example here would be HCl. So the electronegativity of chlorine, we said, was three, while the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. So when we take the difference between those two electronegativities, we get 0.9. So in this case, there is some polarity. The chlorine is more of an electron hog than the hydrogen because it has an electronegativity of three, while the hydrogen only has an electronegativity of 2.1. So this is going to have a net dipole moment towards the chlorine. The chlorine would have a partial negative charge. And the final stage of electronegativity difference, or the highest uh, level on the scale of polarity, is actually called an ionic bond. And this is when the electronegativity becomes greater than two. So here, you can see that we have sodium bonded to chlorine, NaCl, or sodium chloride. Chloride's electronegativity is three, whereas sodium's electronegativity is 0.9. So if we subtract uh, the largest minus the smaller, we get 2.1 as their electronegativity difference. So that is a very large electronegativity difference. This is a, such a polar bond that you can see I've actually written in a plus charge here and a minus charge here. Chlorine is so much more electronegative than sodium that it actually steals one of sodium's electrons. And that is the definition of an ionic bond. It's when one atom steals another atom's electrons to form a bond. So one other thing I'd like to mention is that we can have polar bonds within a molecule, but still have an overall nonpolar molecule. And in order to figure out when this is going to happen, we have to see when the dipole moments cancel each other out. So take for example this molecule I drew up here. 
sodium fluoride. It's got a dipole moment from the sodium to the fluoride this way because fluorine is more electronegative. It's stealing the electrons this way so it's got a partial negative charge. But imagine if there was another fluorine directly on the other side. Well then we would have another dipole moment in exactly the opposite direction, right? And then they would cancel each other out. Think about it like a tug of war where both people are equally strong. They're going to cancel out and thus NaF2 would have an overall non-polar character. So you can have two polar bonds, two very polar bonds within a molecule, but if they cancel each other out geometrically, if they're pulling in the exact opposite direction such, such that they cancel each other out, the overall molecule is nonpolar. So we're gonna go through a bunch more examples of those so you can see exactly how you figure out when an overall molecule is polar or nonpolar. All right, so we just discussed how that if two atoms have different electronegativity levels, they're going to share electrons unequally and thus create a polar bond. And we know that from a polar bond arises a dipole moment, which is a separation of partial charges. So we know that a single bond can be polar, nonpolar, or ionic. But within a molecule, we have multiple bonds, right? I drew out a bunch of Lewis dot structures here. And I'll mention that if you haven't seen my Vesper video on how to draw uh, molecular geometry and we talk about molecular shapes, please go and watch that. This video will make more sense after that. Um, but the idea here is that if we have multiple polar bonds within a molecule, they can cancel each other out geometrically and still make an overall nonpolar molecule. So I'm going to help you decide molecular polarity, in other words, whether or not a molecule is polar, based on its molecular geometry. And for all of these molecular geometries, that's what I have in the black boxes here, these are different molecular geometries, this assumes that all atoms bonded to the central atom are the same. If they're not, the molecule is automatically polar. So in other words, here's our central atom C here for the molecular geometry of linear. If I were to change one of these oxygens to something else, this would automatically be a polar molecule. So again, we assume all atoms bonded to the central atom must be the same. So notice here with our first molecular geometry of linear, it is nonpolar. Even though oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so this would have a dipole moment going this way. This is a polar covalent bond. But conveniently, we have an identical polar covalent bond pulling the opposite direction. So again, it's like a tug of war where both of the dipole moments cancel each other out, making all linear molecular geometry molecules nonpolar. So an example of this is CO2. Okay, our next molecular geometry is trigonal planar. So again here, even though BH is a co polar covalent bond, B and H have different electronegativity levels. These three dipole moments cancel each other out geometrically. You can imagine this B here is maybe like a post and each H is a horse tied to that post pulling on it in different directions. If each horse pulls in the shape of a triangle, they cancel all the forces out. So overall, trigonal planar uh, shapes are nonpolar. So if you have a molecule that is trigonal planar, it is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, the next shape or molecular geometry we're going to go through is bent. So an example of this is water, H2O. So you can see here that again it has polar bonds, but in this case if we had two horses tied to a post on this oxygen and they're both pulling this way and this way, they're going to create a net dipole moment downward if we add together those dipole vectors. So you can see here, I have a shape of a bent molecule and imagine the red is the oxygen and the greens are the hydrogens. If the hydrogens are the horses, the green things are the horses and they're pulling down, this molecule is going to be pulled down. So it's going to be overall polar. Okay. So tetrahedral is our next shape. So we have an example, CH4 or methane. And this one is a little bit harder to draw on the board. I drew the Lewis dot structure right here. But you can see that this is what a tetrahedron actually looks like. 
And if you imagine in three-dimensional space, if four horses were pulling on that red post, uh, the green would be the horses, they're all going to geometrically cancel each other out. So I hope you're getting the trend here that when the forces cancel each other out, the dipole moments cancel each other out, and the overall molecule is nonpolar, even though, again, it contains polar bonds. CH bonds are polar covalent bonds. Okay, the next shape, trigonal pyramidal. So this is a, uh, a, an opportunity for us to look at a different shape that's polar, because you can imagine if these three green dots are the horses, and the red dot is the post, the three horses are pulling in slightly different angles all down. So this is going to be pulled net down, and thus it is a polar molecule. An example of this would be NF3, for which I drew the Lewis dot structure there. And again, please watch my Vesper video to determine these molecular geometries based on the molecular formulas. Um, it's a pretty involved topic, and you need to be good at that. Okay, our next shape is trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal bipyramidal is actually an opportunity to look at a non-polar molecular geometry. So trigonal bipyramidal, all of these phosphorus chlorine bonds, for example, in a PCL5, are going to perfectly cancel each other out in geometric space. And thus, even though there are polar bonds here, they're all going to cancel each other out. So again, go to my Vesper video to see how to get to this trigonal bipyramidal molecular geometry, and you'll see how they all cancel each other out geometrically. Okay, a seesaw shape. Remember, seesaw shape looks like this, kind of like a seesaw. And an example of this is SF4. So imagine we've got a horse pulling this way, a horse pulling this way, and then two horses pulling down. So these will cancel each other out, right? These polar bonds but these two are gonna pull the molecule net downward. So you can think about if the horses move the post, if they pull the post, the molecule is polar. Okay, next one, T-shaped. Again, a polar molecule. Uh, an example would be CLF3. So T-shaped looks like this, kind of like a T. So you can see like there's the top of the T and then the bottom. So this is a polar molecule because these two dipole moments cancel each other out, but then this horse is going to pull the molecule this way, right? So the post moves, so it's polar. Okay, octahedral. This is a non-polar molecular geometry, and you can see here an example is SF6. So look at the octahedral geometry. You can see here that for every dipole moment, there's one this way, one this way to cancel that one out. For this one this way, this horse cancels that out. For the one going up, the horse going down cancels that force out. So all the forces are canceled out, the post is not moved, and thus this is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, a couple more here. So we've got square pyramidal. An example of this is BR5. This is a polar molecule because you can see that unlike the octahedral molecule, uh, molecular geometry, the up and down are canceled, forward and backwards are canceled, but this left here was replaced with a lone pair where that bond used to be. So now there's gonna be a net dipole moment uh, in this bond. And this is gonna pull the molecule in uh, either this direction or this direction, depending on which one of these is more electronegative. So that is a net polar molecule. Okay, finally, square planar. This is actually a non-polar molecule because you can see that for every bond, for every dipole moment, there's something canceling the other one out. So we have one pulling back, one pulling forward, one pulling left, and one pulling right, and we have a net cancellation of dipole moments. So therefore, uh, an example of a square planar molecular geometry, uh, xenon tetrafluoride, would be a nonpolar molecule. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know on facebook.com slash de novo tutoring.